The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. It is, it is a scene, everybody. Um, we have uh, Matt Watto here remotely. I, I wish that we had a picture of this. It's like the head in the jar in Futurama. He is overseeing us from a cell phone, and then we have the rest of us are in person. We are here at ACP 2022, finishing up here to talk about our highlights. I am joined by an all-star team um, who did most of the work, so I'll just mostly ask them what they learned so that then I can learn in turn. <laughs> Selfies are happening. This is an absolute mess. So I am joined, <laughs> just to, to start, um, I am joined by uh, Dr. Chris Chu, who will not be um, speaking. He's here managing the, the very complicated audio since we have multiple formats happening. We have the great Dr. Nora Toronto, Dr. Molly Hoyblein, Dr. Alan Dow, and Dr. Avio Glasser joining me and, of course, Dr. Watto to recap some of the things that we learned here at ACP. Just as a brief reminder, we are the internal medicine podcast that use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. This time, the expert interviews are us, um, or at least recapping what other experts have told us um, through a number of amazing sessions here at ACP 2022 happening in Chicago. So having said all of that, why don't we get rolling right into it? And we'll start with Dr. Molly Hoyblein, who went to a couple of what sound like fantastic sessions. Molly, what did you learn? Thanks, Paul. Uh, well, it was it was just great to be in person and great to be with the team and just all the energy at ACP was really wonderful. So very happy to be here. Um, I went to updates in ambulatory medicine with Drs. Chris Knight and Adelaide McClintock, and they highlighted a study that I think is really important around opioid tapers. Uh, so they, this was a retrospective um, look at commercial uh, insurance plans. And it looked at over 100,000 patients who had been on at least 50 milligrams of morphine equivalents for more than 12 months. And they saw that in patients who were tapered, there was a significantly higher rate of overdose and a significantly higher rate of mental health crises among those who were tapered compared to those who were not. And especially rapid tapers, greater than 10% a month, were associated with more complications. So I think it's just really important to think about in these patients who are stable, you know, certainly there are some times that we need to taper, but maybe for these patients who have been on these for many years, it's not necessarily beneficial for them. And Paul, we talk about this on the upcoming addiction medicine updates episode with Stefan Curtis, who's been, he was telling us about this like four years ago, that pa before this even happened, people were sending him emails about that patients were just being slashed on their doses of opioids and were just not having good outcomes. So I think uh, not all. it's not a one-size-fits-all. You don't necessarily have to taper everyone if they're doing well. Yeah, it's a totally unsurprising finding, and it just kind of emphasizes the point that this should be shared decision-making. We should have be talking about what our goals are and why we're tapering in the first place and just sort of have the patient centered in the middle of that discussion. And then I went to a, an excellent talk by Dr. Elizabeth Porman around physician well-being. And this will mostly just be a teaser because Nora Toronto and I are going to be working on an episode with her for Curbsiders Teach. Um, but I wanted to highlight her advocacy work with the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, to remove stigmatizing language around treatment for mental illness from medical licensing boards. And this is something that needs to happen state by state. So if people are interested in getting involved in that process, um, we will put the link in the show notes. And then a great lecture by Dr. Douglas Paw around common drug interactions and side effects. Um, so just a, a few quick pearls from that one. Um, a recent study in circulation in 2022 showed that regular use of acetaminophen four grams per day caused approximately a five milligram mercury blood pressure elevation in patients with hypertension. So I think we already know that acetaminophen doesn't really work for pain. And then if we are now seeing negative side effects, that is pretty serious. And, you know, starting a new blood pressure medicine, obviously, or often we are just seeing about a five milligram mercury blood pressure reduction. So I think asking patients about their acetaminophen use. A good reminder as well that acetaminophen, even two grams per day, can raise the INR in patients on warfarin. So I'm sure I've heard that many times, but I forget it. And then a new one to me, ticagrelor can cause dyspnea, requiring discontinuation of the medication in about one in 20 patients. So not dangerous, but can be pretty uncomfortable for patients. And, you know, these are often post-cardiac patients who then get a big workup for many things, and it turns out just to be the medication. I think we have multiple times talked about the negatives of tramadol, but it's still prescribed a lot, especially because it's considered sort of a lower risk opioid. But the speaker highlighted the risk of hypoglycemia requiring hospitalization associated with tramadol. 
significantly higher compared with those patients getting a new coding prescription. And we also see tramadol associated with higher risk of mortality, cardiovascular events, and fractures. So just a good reminder to me to go back and look at those tramadol scripts I've been it's writing. Not great, since <laughs> yes. codeine is just hot garbage as a drug itself. So if our comparator is not good, and tramadol is yes. worse, than we're a bad place. And I feel like acetaminophen is one of those medications where you end up just refilling it mindlessly, and then it's just on the medication list for a million years, and we just sort of encourage it to use because we have nothing else. So it's nice to know that it actually causes, not nice to know, but it's good to know it can potentially cause real harms, and we should evaluate if it's actually helping our patients, which <laughs> in my anecdotal experience, it is usually not. Yeah, so Paul, some free advice from, I, I believe it was Dr. Gerlink, who is the, you know, the original hater of tramadol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The tramadol yeah. don't. And um, yeah, he basically said, you know, if you want to give a patient an SNRI, SNRI, give them an SNRI. If you want to give them an opioid, then then give them an opioid. Don't just guess what tramadol is going to do because it's very unpredictable what sort of opioid effect they're going to get. So I, I just think it has very little place uh, unless patients have already tried it and know how they react to it and are doing well. And, you know, in those cases, that's the only time I'm using it. Right. Which does happen. Yeah, the, Dr. Gerling's lines about tramadol, I think there's a comparison to a moody, broody teenager. Uh, and I believe if uh, my Google search serves me well, that's episode 146, Pain Meds and KD. <laughs> Thank you, Avi. <laughs> and then one last pearl from New Medications in Primary Care by Dr. Gerald Smetana. Um, we are all prescribing a lot of Paxlovid right now, and I was not aware that the drug interactions can continue for at least eight days after the ritonavir um, is, is initiated. So even though the course of the treatment is five days, that um, liver interactions will continue for at least eight days and maybe up to 10 days for serious interactions. And just last week, they the government called out and was just like, hey, people, like we have plenty of this stuff. Please start prescribing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard on, I heard on the news uh, because it can be a little bit of uh, extra steps to prescribe it. So I think that's probably why it's not being used as much. And, and then the interactions don't help. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, at least what this speaker highlighted and what I could find is that it really only has been studied in unvaccinated patients. So we don't even know how much it's helping our vaccinated patients. And the interactions aren't nothing. I'm not sure yeah. how often everyone here has tried to prescribe it, but it is like the first patient I tried to prescribe it for was a renal transplant patient and about three medications are medication I'm like, this, this is probably not, not going to work happen. for this particular patient. So it's I mean, sheer list. It's uh, phenomenal. The number of medications that it interacts with is is quite quite substantial, and it's very common medications as well as medications that that more complex patients are on. And Molly, I see you've referenced in the show notes uh, for listeners the Liverpool Drug Interaction site, our old favorite for I think Hep C as well. So it's it's a nice one to check just to make sure you're not going to inadvertently um, <laughs> overdose your patient or cause problems. Yeah, they have a whole COVID specific section, so very very easy to use. <laughs> just grim days. This episode is sponsored by Indeed. And listeners, you know that I'm a big fan of Indeed. And recently, the Curbsiders, we used Indeed for a sponsored job post, and we had great results. We had so many high-quality applicants, and Indeed made it easy to sort through the applications, to set up virtual interviews. What I love about Indeed is they have all these time-saving tools. For instance, Indeed Instant Match gives about 80% of employers quality candidates whose resume matches the job description the moment they sponsor a job, and that's according to Indeed Data U.S., Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash internal medicine. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash internal medicine. Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Terms and conditions apply. Pay per qualified applicant not available for all users. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Great. Let's move on to Nora. And it looks, Nora, like you went to 27 different talks by my count. This is, you got a lot of... <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I hopped in and <laughs> sure. out. Um, You're no, pulling it... a Watto, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for for years. Skip. You know, uh, I, I can't disclose my source for that. But um, yeah, so I, I got the chance to attend a bunch of really interesting talks. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the most interesting ones on Thursday, I think, that I attended was the perioperative anticoagulation talk um, by Andrew Dunn, um, who gave a really riveting talk about uh, a lot of clinical trial data from the last like 15 years. Um, 
The first point that he really rehashed uh, by going through a bunch of the different trial data uh, was reiterating that there still is really not super compelling evidence for bridging patients perioperatively, um, except for patients who are extraordinarily high risk, like stroke in the last three months or, or mechanical valves, though there is some interesting and somewhat compelling data that perhaps not all mechanical valve patients need uh, bridging. Um, the, the other reason that I wanted to highlight this was that the, the trial names that he referenced were so good. Um, so there's uh, bruise control, mm -hmm. there's bruise control two, and then uh, the dentist study, which is a 2020 study, uh, which is, is a little bit different, but this is just this uh, study was uh, published looking at whether or not you uh, need to stop DOAX or warfarin uh, during dental extractions. Um, and it was obviously in a dentist uh, setting, <laughs> one would hope. Um, no major bleeding uh, increased risk during dental extractions in the patients who continued DOAX and warfarin compared to those who didn't. Um, and then the only other trial that was the newest trial, uh, Periop 2, uh, was the one that looked at uh, uh, bridging and looked at a specific uh, subgroup analysis in mechanical valve patients, showed that uh, kind of in, I think, their population of 300 or so mechanical valve patients, um, there wasn't an increased risk of clot in patients who were not bridged. And that was, my, did that include mitral and aortic valves? So it did. Um, I think there's some signal, and Avi, please jump in here. There's some signal that uh, aortic valve only patients may be at lower risk of, of clot and therefore may not need to be bridged, whereas mitral valve, obviously, we're still quite concerned. Yeah. I'm so glad that these studies all got airtime and attention at the conference. Um, and, and Dr. Dunn is just a fantastic speaker. Um, and you, not everyone has access to a dedicated pre-op clinic like the one that I run at Cashlack Northwest. Um, and a lot of these questions, especially before sort of non-OR-based procedures, are going to come through primary care. So I love that you're sharing the dentist study because I'm sure so many primary care clinics get that question. I'm sure PCPs get that my chart message. Um, and yeah, I think we, we've learned from a lot of these trials that the, the panacea or the, the security blanket of bridging doesn't decrease thrombotic risk pre or post-op. Uh, the DOAC, I love how the DOACs have revolutionized perioperative anticoagulation management. They're just so much easier, especially with the short half-life. Um, but the dental work is, is a great example that there are additional risk bleeding risk mitigation steps that you can take. And the dental associations have been very, very proactive with, um, with their guidelines. So the ADA is a great resource. Um, but you know, mechanical compression, packing, suturing when you might not suture a socket, tranexamic acid is another alternative. So yeah, I, I am thrilled by the state. And then for the, in terms of mechanical valves, there's, I, I agree, there's some data out there that some patients with aortic valves might be lower risk I think their type of valve, so mm -hmm. like ball and cage is still higher risk. If you have LV dysfunction, you're higher risk. If you have concurrent AFib, you're higher risk. So I think it's going to be the rare patient with an aortic valve who we can very, at this time very, very confidently say, you are at low risk. I'm not going to bridge you. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of thinking about the company an aortic valve replacement keeps, um, but hopefully more to come. And gosh darn it, if we ever get DOAX approved for mechanical valves, this is going to be really awesome. And then the, the other high-risk patient. So a uh, high-risk patient who is a high risk of recurrent thrombo, and uh, like VTE, agree they're in the setting of warfarin therapy may be a good candidate to consider bridging. Um, but what this is what I, I tell my, my colleagues as well. If you feel that they're high risk based on time from the event, so time from an AFib-related mm -hmm. stroke or time from a DVTPE, maybe the question isn't should we bridge you, but should we be doing this surgery in this time frame or this high-risk patient mm -hmm. as it is. Yeah, that, that was actually a big uh, source of conversation in this uh, talk as well in the context more of uh, stents and uh, shortly post-stent mm -hmm. uh, surgical requirements and, and kind of the first line if you're in that window within three or so months where you're on dual antiplatelet um, uh, first 
question being, can we actually delay the surgery? And then, and then if you can't delay the surgery, then figuring out, do we actually need to do IV cangrelor in addition to aspirin, that sort of thing. Love it. Love to hear that. Do you, you think we should talk about men's now? I feel like this is a good time. I mean, we're in periodic land. This, this, now's the time <laughs> yeah. to do it. <laughs> so men's, men's, I've been interested in this. And we, they talked about it at SGM. They talked about it again at ACP. And I think, I think I have a way to make this information actionable. So MINS is myocardial infarction after non-cardiac surgery. And it's really common, maybe up to 20% of inpatients having surgery will have this. Most of them are going to be asymptomatic. So you're only going to pick it up if you happen to check atroponin. But the question is what to do with this. And I thought the speaker had very practical advice. They said, because we have good information from the vision study, which was in 2014, that showed 30-day events were increased. Um, and and then another later look back in 2019 said that at 30 days and a year, there's increased cardiac risk, increased risk of mortality, that we should treat this as a positive stress test and we should do what we can to mitigate cardiac risk factors, doing things like putting patients on statin uh, or aspirin and uh, maybe referring them to cardiology, maybe doing some non-invasive testing. Avi, is, is that more or less what you do in your practice? Yeah, I think that's a, I really love that analogy that MINS is some signal. And I think this is the challenge of MINS. And you'll often hear people say, we don't have a protocol for screening for MINS. We don't routinely check pre proponents because we don't know what to do with it afterwards, or we haven't developed a pathway with our inpatient cardiologists. But I would say, like, I would push back and say, have some sort of first step, put on your internist thinking cap. What are you going to do with that information and how could it really help a patient's long-term outcomes and risk reduction? So I love the stress test analogy. And I think one of the biggest challenges for men's, if you look at some of the current guidelines, is step one, determine if this is a type one or type two MI. And that's really, really hard to do. And sometimes the, the MI that you think is type two, the patient will end up having obstructive coronary disease. And even if it's not a type one, you now have learned that they have coronary disease that needs to be appropriately managed in the outpatient setting. So I think, and we, and yes, we have data that the, the secondary prevention uh, initiation after MINS is really lacking. So I think taking that risk reduction, moving from the primary to the secondary prevention realm is a really, really important step. Um, should this patient be on a statin? Should this patient be on an antiplatelet agent? Should they be getting, and the answer is yes, to are they getting tobacco cessation counseling or <laughs> other life, yes, you should be getting tobacco cessation counseling. Um, what other lifestyle modification counseling should you initiate once they have that index event? And then they, you know, the question is, do you do, do you go straight to cath? Do you do a stress to look for inducible ischemia? Um, and that there's definitely going to be practice variation there. This feels hauntingly similar to when we first started talking about like the type one and type two NSTEMIs, where like type two NSTEMIs we know have or tend to worse prognosis and higher mortality. And like, that seems bad. What do you do about that? Oh, like put on a statin or something. Like it just, <laughs> so it'd like, be helpful to actually get some, some concrete guidance as we move forward. And also just taking that step back, like for MINS, really the first first step is to determine if there's a non-cardiac or non-coronary explanation. So if someone had a massive PE post-op in his right heart strain, the troponin, detectable troponin level, the troponin leak, is from a non or non coronary cause of um, myocardial injury. If someone, I think I was sharing this example yesterday, if somebody comes in as, uh, through the trauma activation system and they had a cardiac contusion from the hor horrendous multiple uh, motor vehicle accident, and they have a de detectable troponin, even if they're you know, 65 with diabetes and, and smoke, you do you go down the men's pathway or do you say this is non this is non men's this is another cause of cardiac injury so so long story short men's really takes a lot of diagnostic reasoning clinical reasoning and I think we're going to be continuing to tackle these challenges for a long time but hopefully we'll continue to have better guidance about how diagnosing someone with men's changes management improves long-term health. It kind of, kind of sounds like you need to understand the anatomy and if there's a remediable lesion yeah. or not, because that, that would definitely change what you would do. Absolutely. I completely agree. Do we have anything else periop while we're in periop land? 
The the only other interesting pearl uh, that I did not know was about reversal agents yeah, uh, that was in this session. Um, and so uh, uh, Dr. Dunn talked about uh, anti 10 A inhibitor or 10 A inhibitors, um, uh, including andexanet alpha, um, which is the main 10 A inhibitor reversal agent. Um, it costs twenty four thousand dollars a dose, FYI. Um, and uh, and you do actually have an increased risk within 30 days of thrombosis, around 10%, according to the 2019 Nejim trial. Um, so so it's not a not a medication to administer uh, willy nilly for either of those reasons. Um, the the only context in which he said it, it may be worth considering is really with intracranial hemorrhage. Um, other other uh, profuse bleeds often are manageable kind of without yeah. it. Um, the only other thing that I learned uh, from this trial was that um, many of the patients in the trial did have good hemostasis after the medication, but they actually required two doses mm -hmm. because the the um, reversal agent wears off more quickly than the um, the 10A inhibitors. Yeah, I agree. I think the I, I'm most intrigued by the, the neurosurgical patient population data for this for this agent, um, I think really when you take it outside of the intracranial emergency setting, um, it's expensive. There's risk. It may not be stocked at your cash lock facility. Um, and it, the pearl that I would add is that the most important question is to really get a very granular med rec. When was your last dose? And often, if somebody's coming in for surgery, let's use hip fracture as an example. Unless they took their dose, like literally like syncopized while they were swallowing their DOAC, there may have been already several hours from last dose to presentation, and then you have the diagnostic process, and then you're getting the OR booked. So I think sometimes people underestimate how much time they've had since last dose and how many half-lives they've already passed through, and if that drug is really indicated and necessary for that patient um, by virtue of time and other hemostasis steps and safeguards. That makes a lot of sense. Nora, you yeah. also, uh, speaking of things that leak, I guess, we were also sort of talking about Nocturia. Um, that was, well. the, yeah, that was the, that was the theme, Expert segue, yeah, by the yeah, way, yeah, I'm yeah. a professional really, podcaster. Really I've been doing this like there. six years. <laughs> um, yeah, so I attended the Nocturia talk the day before, and uh, lots of high-yield pearls in it. One that I learned was that uh, the prevalence of OSA in patients with Nocturia is quite high, apparently around 75% in a 2020 study, whatever that patient population looked like. And moreover, that CPAP in initiation in patients with OSA actually treated nocturia symptoms, led to fewer events of nocturia per night, and also improved quality of life. Um, and so this is kind of a strong recommendation to think about testing in patients who come to you with nocturia because many of them will have risk factors for OSA. Can I, I'm actually, I'm going to hop in and talk about OSA for a second, if you don't mind, because I, I know you have some more nocturia tidbits, but I did go to Sheila Sai's talk on OSA and OHS. And it was, I mean, it was a lot of really great fundamentals, and she actually went into a lot of detail about the various ingredients that go into polysomnography and what they're looking at specifically in a granular way that I hadn't thought about before. And I won't go too much into all that, but there were two facts, one which everybody sort of knew about in this table already, but I didn't know, where she just, and then there's also the tennis ball trick. And then I said, what's the tennis ball trick? And apparently, for patients who specifically have apnea when supine, there are, <laughs> I want to call them fancy, but that's not true. They're basically girdles that you can sort of put on, like this whole sort of complicated strap system that actually has this sort of ball on the back so you can't lie flat on your back comfortably that keeps patients from lying supine that can actually manage sleep apnea, not as well as CPAP, but it can, it can help. It can help improve it. And our Dr. Sai actually suggested just getting a fanny pack, putting tennis balls in it, and just having the fanny pack towards the, the patient's back as sort of a, a surrogate for that, which I had never heard of before. Um, and then the other fun factoid, well, fun's probably not the right word, but the other factoid in terms of why we should treat um, OSA, and yes, there's certainly lots of cardiovascular and endocrinopathy sort of associated with it, but from a public service standpoint, I, I had forgotten that patients with untreated sleep apnea have an increased risk of motor vehicle accidents three to seven fold compared to patients who have it treated. So I, like, you think about it with commercial drug drivers and that kind of stuff, but I just forget about even that piece of counseling with my patients. So I, I thought that was probably worth saying out loud before we go back into nocturial land, but it was 
Uh, excellent, excellent talk on OHS and, and OSA. Get a chance to go back and look at the notes. Can I quickly add a, an OSA Periot Pearl? Please. I, I love the tennis ball trick. I, I've been aware of it. Um, and I've certainly done a, a pre-op risk assessment on a patient who says, you know, I did the sleep study. It's mild. I was told, I said, do you get a CPAP? And they said, were you, no, I just told me not to sleep on my back. So then applying that to the periop setting and, and risk reduction related to OSA, um, I'll definitely say there are patients who don't have CPAP, insurance delays, health system delays with the pandemic, uh, can't tolerate it from claustrophobia or whatnot. And I will include the counseling, you know, don't sleep flat on your back at home or in the hospital. If you're in the hospital, prop the head of the bed up, you know, sleep on your side, sleep in a recliner. So I, I love extrapolating from the tennis ball uh, advice to the periop setting as a sort of low harm, potentially gain benefit uh, intervention for patients who are not on CPAP or can't tolerate it. Yeah, Dr. Sy, she actually spent a good chunk of time talking about troubleshooting patients who say they don't tolerate it. Because I feel like it's, I, it's probably too often I just give up. Like, the patient's like, I don't like it. I can't wear it. It makes mm -hmm. me feel like I'm suffocating. You're like, well, that's too bad. You know, good luck with all the high blood pressure. But there are there are different masks that you can use. There are sort of um, nasal devices. There are positional things that you can use. You can certainly, you can humidify and heat. And there are certain even device modifications that actually will sort of relax some of the CPAP during um, exhalation so that you don't feel like you're fighting the machine constantly. So there's things that can be done. So it's actually worth investigating that intolerance a little bit more deeply, which I also really appreciated. So that was our, our sleep apnea sideline. Did you want to tell us, Nora, a little bit about <laughs> yeah, back to nocturia? Back to nocturia. Back to nocturia. Another problem, very common. Um, apparently, caffeine intake not epidemiologically associated with nocturia. One little pearl that made me really, really happy about my <laughs> ongoing caffeine intake and my risk of, of various uh, conditions in the future. <laughs> the kind of crux of management of nocturia is still behavioral strategy, kind of behavioral modification and pelvic floor physical therapy for women, which, which actually works really remarkably mm -hmm. well. Um, and uh, the medications, pharmacology-wise, uh, there, there aren't agents that are going to solve this it, kind of all at once. Um, the FDA did just approve this desmopressin analog, um, which uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2017 or 2018, um, the, the presenter for this, uh, for this talk was uh, very cautious about using it, does not prescribe it to patients because of the risk of severe hyponatremia. The trial was in a really kind of selected patient population, um, and all of the deaths and the adverse events and hospitalizations from severe hyponatremia, I believe, were in the, the desmopressin treatment group and also in elderly patients over 65, which is many of the patients that are, are suffering from nocturia. So that about wraps up the, the nocturia pearls that There's I nocturia got. Nocturia corner. Okay, great. This episode is brought to you by Locum Story. Listeners, have you ever considered a different way of practicing medicine? Maybe you're feeling burned out, maybe you need a change of pace, or do you just want to supplement your income and buy something nice for yourself? Come on. Well, locum tenens, that might be the solution for you. And if you're considering locum tenens, either as a full-time thing or on the side, you probably have a question or two or maybe 20. And fortunately, locumstory.com has the answers that you need. It's packed with unbiased information and advice from physicians like you. LocumStory.com has nothing to sell. It's simply a resource for information. You'll find handy tools that let you see locums trends for your specialty, compare different agencies that do locums, and even a quiz to help you decide if locums is right for you. LocumStory.com has answers that range from basic, like what is locum tenens, all the way to the more complex stuff that involves taxes and licensing and so much more. So what are you waiting for? LocumStory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about locums. Come on, people. Get that money. And then why don't we finish strong with, with potassium? Yeah, so so I attended the um, updates in nephrology lecture, which was also really high yield, I thought. Um, was uh, very, very concise and had like point after point about the interesting clinical trials that have happened in, in the, um, the renal space in the last uh, year or two. Um, updates in hypertension management. Uh, don't forget about uh, your blood pressure control is better, um, uh, even in the elderly. That was kind of the, the name of the game. Um, one interesting uh, management uh, pearl for blood pressure management uh, was using salt substitutes, which I... I 
have anecdotally heard about and kind of is on the list of, of things that we recommend to patients, but there is actually an interesting trial in 2021, the SAS trial in China looked at a large population and they basically just gave salt substitute or uh, normal salt to patients for their dining tables. And then they followed them over five years and the salt substitute group had lower blood pressure and actually had a lower risk of cardiovascular events. So it seems like a very low hanging fruit, kind of easy dining table recommendation to make. Nora, I want to jump in. I was at that one as well. What the, the salt substitute they were using was potassium chloride. And yep. he, he made the point that this is on a a population level, there was 300 villages that had just a small amount, like 25% of the table salt was this potassium chloride uh, and 75% remained sodium chloride in 300 of the villages. The other 300 had just 100% sodium chloride. And even that small 25% change uh, did did show on a population level this this effect. But I think you, you need to still think, is my patient on uh, spironolactone mm-hmm. and ACEs and ARBs, and is their baseline potassium already high? Then, then that maybe this isn't for them. But on a population level, this seems to help. And uh, I, I thought it was very practical stuff. In in the food is medicine talk, which I just wanted to briefly highlight, uh, which goes along with this. Uh, Dr. Michelle McMacken was a fantastic presenter, and she had a lot of very like practical tips. And since you're, we're talking about diet here, I wanted to jump in. And a lot of a lot of the take home from her talk was that small changes, small small things like substituting plant proteins for animal proteins can have big health benefits. And um, a couple quick hits. So number one, uh, before you start making all these food recommendations, you you just think about your patient and whether or not they have food insecurity. So think about that uh, and their ability to follow some of these recommendations. Um, But she did say that while it seems like there's a lot of controversy in the nutritional world, Actually, there are a lot of like core principles that that we agree upon, one of which is that um, she talked about these green box foods, which give me a second to pull up here. So the green box foods, whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, pretty much everyone agrees that those are good for you. And it's hard to find a study that shows negative health effects from them. The red box foods, where pretty much everyone agrees these are not good for you, and it's easy to find studies that these are harmful, of red box foods are processed meats, red meats, added sugars, refined grains, and ultra processed foods. So I, I think those are just big things that we can tell patients that we can improve their overall health just by, you know, substituting some plant-based uh, protein from healthy sources, the stuff in the green box that I listed, and avoiding some of those red box foods. She also said that the Mediterranean diet is great but people interpret that and they're just like, they romanticize it. They're like, oh, I eat a Mediterranean diet because I eat chocolate and I have a glass of wine with my cheeseburger. So <laughs> don't don't think of a Mediterranean diet just meaning you're adding wine to an otherwise unhealthy meal. <laughs> um, and then finally, in the post, in questions after the fact, someone asked her about artificial sweeteners and she said her practice of counseling has changed a little bit in the past few years where she's come to think of artificial sweeteners almost as a form of harm reduction because if they're substituting artificial sweeteners for refined sugar, maybe that's not the best, but if that's the best they can do, then that's probably better than um, refined sugars. So I think those are just some quick hits from that one. It was a great talk. And uh, yeah, I know I know our team is looking to make some nutrition shows in the near future audience. So, so look out for those. Let me throw in one more because I went to that too and I, I, I thought it was, was great. And I, I think I have this number right. I believe she said that if you add just one serving of fruits or vegetables, fresh fruits or vegetables a day, your risk of mortality and cardiovascular is all the bad things goes down by about 8%. And it was, it was just a great way to think about this little, just, just add one more serving, substitute that for you know bacon, pasta, whatever's in sort of that red box, um, tremendous health benefits. And I was like, oh, I I can do that, and I can probably talk my patients into doing that. It's low-hanging fruit, as some might say. (laughs) No. (laughs) You just picked a good one. (laughs) (laughs) So 
So applause for applause. <laughs> and then, Matt, while we're hearing your dulcet tones, I mean, this feels like the right time just to ask you to, do you want to tell us about the rheumatology session that you went to? We'll see, meanwhile, if we can think of any other clever wordplay. Any other corny analogies? Yeah, I think the, rheumat- the, the rheumatology stuff, uh, these are very quick as well. So some things I didn't know, the speaker gave a case about bilateral shoulder aching being a, present in 97% of patients with polymyalgia rheumatica. And Paul, we, we were lamenting a little bit before, this is a very challenging diagnosis. I think it's always fuzzy whether or not someone has it and you're committing them to one to three years of steroids, which is certainly not great. So the, she just mentioned that, that you know, look out for that feature and the ULAR and the ACR guidelines for diagnosing it, they, they mentioned that you should, you have to have age above 50, bilateral shoulder aching should be a prominent feature and an elevated ESR CRP to be considered for this diagnosis. So the shoulder aching is just something that I I hadn't really keyed in on. The other thing, Paul, and you knew this, but I did not know this, is that with gout, patients who, even if they have a first flare of gout, these there's three groups that you can consider putting them right on urate lowering therapy because they're high risk for future flares. Anyone with CKD3 or higher, anybody who has a uric acid level greater than nine, and anybody who has a history of urolithiasis. So especially the serum uric acid level, Paul, I found that, uh, I was surprised at that, but it, you, you've already been doing this, I think. Well, the, actually the level was the one that I probably did not think of as commonly, the, the presence of kidney stones, and then also the, the presence of CKD3, I, I think I've been a little bit more aggressive with, but I, didn't, I, I don't think I think about the absolute number very much in terms of the uric acids, that's helpful. Yeah, so I, I think the, I know the ACP and the ACR differ a little bit on their, their love of uric acid, but I do think <laughs> this was, I, I do think this is a usable pearl. And then finally, for glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, um, for our, us in primary care, Paul, how, how many milligrams of prednisone do you think people need to be on and for how long before it gets, you know, before we need to worry about their bone density? I'm going to say- It's less than you'd think. Oh, I was going to go uh, 120 milligrams for at least a decade. Is it lower than that? <laughs> You're 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 brilliant, Paul. So it's it's a lot lower than you'd think. It's it's two and a half milligrams. Anyone's on two and a half milligrams or more for more than three months, um, you should you should check a bone density and calculate a FRAX score because people with a moderate risk or higher score on FRAX, you should consider treating them um, to protect their bone density. And and this is a front loaded process. That was a big that that's the big pearl here. In the first few months, that's when they lose a lot of the bone. So if someone's going to be on more than two and a half of prednisone for more than three months, you should check a baseline bone density and consider treating them to protect their bone density. Preserve. There was a similar stat about cardiovascular disease, and it, and basically five milligrams or more for more than six months, your risk is fifty percent higher or even double, depending on how high the dose is. But it, but it is these these smaller doses of steroids that have huge effects. Wow. They feel almost homeopathic just because the number, but it turns out yeah. it makes real harms. Yeah. Yeah. Avi, what, what did you learn? Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm going to pivot us a little away from the direct clinical updates, direct clinical pearls. Um, I went to more sort of systems level type talks and leadership talks. Um, I'm going to start by sharing um, Dr. Quinn Capers did the first keynote. And as always, Dr. Capers is an incredibly enlightening speaker. I'm going to share one pearl that really jumped out at me based on um, some of the, the academic hats I wear. We have mounting data that diversity improves outcomes at the patient end and the clinician end of things. Um, but he shared one research paper that uh, diversity among authors and an authorship team improves impact, the ability to generate impact in research, specifically number of citations. And and this group uh, from a publication from 2018 looked at several types of diversity, ethnicity, diversity, gender, affiliation, and academic age. So I anticipate that was time and rank. I don't know why they didn't define racial diversity, but used ethnic. And ethnic diversity had the strongest impact for boosting the impact or the impact gain of papers and scientists themselves. Um, so my takeaway from that was when you are, I, I know we talked about gender equity in, in teams and when I'm doing scholarship or research, I'm tr- I really try to make sure we have gender equity represented, but to be very, very mindful about diversity um, as defined in other ways, especially when it comes to trying to shore up the leaky pipeline in medicine. And then I'm going to share several pearls from um, 
telehealth domain. So there was a wonderful talk about alternative uh, primary care practice models, and Dr. Todd Vento spent a lot of time talking about uh, how telehealth had been successful for his uh, his healthcare system. And he defined the concepts of telepresence and teleetiquette, which I thought were really cool. I was not aware of those terms, but he defines telepresence as the view of you. So being very mindful of what your surroundings, what your background, what what a patient sees when they're looking at you on a telehealth visit and how that may help or harm developing rapport. I know defining professionalism is a challenging topic in medicine, so it wasn't as much that, but you know, is it a cluttered environment? What's behind you? What's visible to the patient? He was of the, the mindset that pets pets wandering through can help. <laughs> and then tell it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then tell <laughs> etiquette, which he it seemed to focus more on the concept of just having a system uh, with your team in primary care. So the start to finish. So if there, you have a, an MA who's doing the virtual rooming or how are you interacting with your own team members and ancillary staff in your telehealth practice? I thought those are interesting things. And then in pivoting back to the question of diversity and are we serving our diverse patients, again, as broadly defined with telehealth, especially during the pandemic, um, Dr. Tal Vento and, and others have talked about how if we wave the magic wand and, and make this best case scenario that I ideally telehealth would have the potential to decrease disparities, especially for geographically isolated rural communities, other groups. So he specifically gave the examples of patients in homeless shelters or patients who are incarcerated or patients who might be in an inpatient or an outpatient substance use disorder program. But I actually, I, I did a talk where I shared some tele- telehealth pearls. Uh, and unfortunately, there actually is data that we are we have a long way to go in terms of reaching our diverse patients when it comes to telehealth. Um, And there was uh, data published from, I'll include the link in the show notes, from my institution alone, that for all the well-intentioned, it's a pandemic, we're going to pivot, we're going to make sure that vulnerable patients, including those who we know had some of the highest rates of COVID and COVID mortality, were kept safe by having visits to their home, that those were the very patients who were less likely to have telehealth visits or less likely to have video over phone visits. Um, and then there's a couple articles published in Annals of Internal Medicine itself that shows that we are just not successfully reaching older patients. So we're going to do telehealth visits for older patients because they're at high risk of COVID complications, especially before vaccines were available. And we're just not getting those patients onto telehealth visits. I do. Like, I struggle with this because I feel like that's exactly right. I think telehealth done properly requires actually a fair amount of intensive resources, both on the healthcare side and the yeah. patient side. And I think our older patients and our sight impaired patients and people who don't have access to consistent internet, like all those things, mm-hmm. decrease the ability to do a really effective visit, the, the, the video component, God bless and good luck. But like, I, you know, eventually I think it does run the risk of devolving into a phone call, which you yeah. can do some stuff with, but frankly is not as high it's quality care same. as you can do in the office. So I, I think it's, it's going to require an incredible investment in our patients and I think ourselves to actually be able to do it in a way that's meaningful and does actually lower these barriers. Yeah, and these are questions. Um, uh, when I when I'm not at Cashlack Northwest, I'm in Oregon, <laughs> in, in the Pacific Northwest, and this is a question that we've tackled for our group. Uh, and really, we're trying to prioritize rural, geographically isolated patients who don't have the gas money to drive six hours each direction to come to the university center, but often bandwidth, technology, devices are challenges. Um, and then along those lines, we talk about you know, equity in terms of the financial cost of driving to the academic center or the tertiary care center. There's a really cool, but there's several papers that have looked at the the cost savings or the opportunity costs of offering telehealth visits. So again, are we reaching disadvantaged, vulnerable patient populations? How much time is saved? How much money is saved? And there's a really cool study out of UCLA that showed even um, driving across the LA metro area depending on your job, your hourly wage, the, how old your car is, how much gas costs, that even offering a telehealth visit to someone who lives on the other side of town, my air quotes, the other side of town, can represent huge time and cost savings. The other speaker for this alternative models of primary care, Dr. Leah Marcotte, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, talks about features that can reduce burnout in the primary care models. And she brought up the concept of the, the combination of psychological safety and adaptive reserve. And honestly, adaptive reserve was a term that I'd never heard, but that's basically a measure of flexibility, ability to be flexible and resilient in a practice. So uh, she shared one study that I'll include in the show notes that 
zero burnout practices. And I'm just like, gosh darn it, if you achieve zero burnout in your primary care group, you should be nominated for a Nobel Prize. That higher levels of reported adaptive reserve and psychological safety were predictors of less burnout or zero burnouts, Um, but feeling less practical. And especially when it comes to telehealth, can we have be flexible with start stop times? Can we be flexible and dynamic with meeting the the needs of someone who is experiencing a lot of childcare stresses, especially during the pandemic? Can we do somebody with a later start because they have teenagers in high school who have to get on to virtual learning? And then just my last pearl, not so much as a pearl as a uh, a, a shout out to the curbsiders. I went to Dr. Saget's talk on apps on the wards, not just for millennials. A wonderful overview of how we as clinicians can use apps for learning as well as in real time synchronous learning on wards, uh, how patients may be using apps if they're studied or not studied, uh, but how they may be collecting data via apps, which can also be used for telehealth visits. Um, But they said, and I love this, I know other people have talked about this, it's not only the apps, but what you do with your phone at large. And put in a plug for several podcasts, including the Curbsiders, as well as uh, Med Twitter. And and I thought he did a fantastic job of acknowledging the cons that sometimes come with Med Twitter and that it is not all um, roses and sunshine, but... At, at its best moments, Med Twitter is, has really been a wonderful community and uh, threw in some wonderful shout outs to the MedEd community on Twitter. And is now owned by Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. I know it's, it's, I don't know how I can make it any more perfect than it already is. So I think we're going to be okay. All right. Let's, let's finish with Dr. Alan Dow. Alan, what did you learn? Many things, Paul, many things. Um, Actually, I want to start with building off of what what Avi said. So, um, and I went to her talk, it was fantastic. Also, the co-presenter was talking about hospital at home. So, so good one to go listen to. And let me just fanboy on that for a second. I think one of the fascinating things that's happening is um, what's going to happen with how these models get paid for, because a lot of them are supported under pandemic emergency, different clauses. And if the pandemic emergency goes away, all of a sudden it's like, how do we pay for these things that are still going? And so that's something that I'm keeping an eye on. And I heard about that in your session. And then I also heard about it in uh, some of the advocacy sessions that are going on. I don't know if you want to say about that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So um, advocacy for ongoing telehealth is a, is a huge topic. And one that I know ACP is uh, has acknowledged and I believe is working on. Um, it's not only the payment though, but it's also the licensure. So I shared I, I shared in the session that I had literally an hour before we started gotten the email from the Washington Medical Board that my application to be licensed in Washington State, in addition to Oregon, was actively being worked on. Um, but we are anticipating that our waiver for telehealth in Washington State, and I, I'm spitting distance from the Oregon-Washington border, if you don't know your Cashlack Northwest geography. Um, and so we are going to get everyone in, in, in my clinic uh, dual license so that we can continue to do telehealth, you know, five, 10 miles north of Portland. Yeah. So there's all these, these wonderful things with hospital at home and telehealth that are good for patients and good for practices. And hopefully we can continue to do them and we yeah. need to advocate for those. The, the second advocacy thing that came out of the, the advocacy session was the idea that there's a lot of, I think, pretty good ideas on the Democratic side, that, but they just aren't moving forward for various political reasons. And then on the Republican side, there's a lot of state level things that really are challenges to the physician-patient relationship, and, and a lot of this comes out of out of the abortion, you know, arguments for for years and years about, you know, is that a a private clinical conversation or is that something that should be in the public good? But the ivermectin issue with uh, prescription for COVID is another example of that, and so it's something as an advocacy person to thinking about our role in advocating for the importance of physicians and patients being able to make decisions together uh, around various clinical issues is something that I think we need to, to really start to focus on and, and do some, some work around. All right, back to more clinically focused stuff. I went to a great talk about obesity that was the Prasad lecture given by uh, Carolyn Apovian. And a big thrust of her talk was to think about obesity as a hormonal disease, which was valuable for me to hear because I think we all know that our most effective obesity therapy right now is gastric bypass surgery. And what she said was that gastric bypass surgery, really we should think about as a hormonal therapy because what we're doing is taking those cells that that present food to and we're, we're rearranging the order in which they get presented. And so you have um, increased early satiety 
and decrease hunger based on sort of resetting of or hormonal things. And where we are moving to is a model, maybe not of surgical obesity management down the road, but of medical management that has similar outcomes to gastric bypass surgery. We know that, that gastric bypass surgeries are common, but also that we don't provide them to as, as nearly as many patients as we should. There are a couple medical things that she, she focused on in terms of, of pharmacology with the idea of how do we um, start to maybe reset some of these hormonal imbalances. So semaglutide is our, our probably best medical therapy right now. It's a GLP-1 agonist. You know, is about a 20-pound weight loss for patients that, that get it. And then there's a, a new drug that just had some results of a study announced in a press release two days ago. Not been peer-reviewed, not been published, but I think something we need to sort of keep on on the on the horizon coming towards us. And this is terzepatide. And terzepatide is a GLP-1 agonist like semaglutide plus a GIP agonist. And so we've now got sort of dual hormonal therapy. And she said, this is going to be sort of the paradigm is, you know, this multiple hormonal type of thing as we try to reset our hypothalamic set points and, and work towards, towards, you know, less, less obesity. And with terzepatide, there was a 50 pound weight loss across the patients in the study average. And so it's remarkable to think about the impact of that and, and what that could mean, um, particularly as obesity is pushing forward all sorts of other health problems, sleep apnea, AFib, you know, pick your pick hypertension, pick your, pick your disease. So that was obesity. Second sort of uh, paradigm changing presentation I went to was about PrEP as part of the infectious disease update. And this was Victoria Burke that talked about this. There's a medication called cabotegravir, which is a IM injectable every eight week pre-exposure prophylaxis medication. And it was studied uh, relative to combivir, which is our, our current PrEP oral medication that's, that's once a day. Combivir we know is about three times better at um, decreasing the risk of HIV infection in, in men who have sex with men and transgender women. This cabotegravir study, same population, but this injection once every eight months, and it was about three times better than combivir. Um, both those studies were actually stopped early because of, of success. When you think about what this might mean, we could get to a treatment approach where a patient who qualifies for PrEP would come into the office every eight weeks and get an injection. And so that would be a little bit of a different shift from us, but similar to how we think about Depo-Provera, or we used to think about B12 injections, things like that with someone coming to the office for, for a, a regular injection. The other thing is that this medicine is, is so powerful in terms of decreasing HIV transmission that we can start to get into a paradigm where we might think about HIV elimination. And I'm, I'm not sure that we're there yet, but in the same way that we start to think about hep C elimination, and I know you guys did an episode about that very recently, this is one where, you know, it's a disease that when I was coming in training, so I was an intern in 2000, I was just a little bit past when we'd had, you know, lots and lots of patients dying of HIV, but I certainly saw a lot of patients die of HIV earlier in my training. I wasn't in the 90s when it was sort of the pre-AZT days and the people that I worked with really closely would talk about those days, but it was very much like the COVID pandemic where you just had lots of sick people that were dying around you. And we're now making it to a point where in my career, potentially we could see HIV become a very rare disease. And that's exciting to think about in the same way that hep C might be able to get there. And you know, we've, we've not eliminated an infectious disease in this same kind of way with you know, some kind of therapy like that. And you know, we've, we've had vaccinations for smallpox, but not something like that. So that's exciting. So fascinating and, and exciting to hear you know, as we approach the 40 year mark of uh, HIV, of us knowing that what HIV was. Was there any discussion about how the updates to vaccination development because of the COVID pandemic might translate over into a vaccine for HIV? No, there, there wasn't. And I didn't hear any of that here. I mean, the one thing I've heard about with mRNA vaccination is their use in cancer therapies. And so you take cancer mRNA and put it in a vaccine and use that to immunize. So that that's a pretty interesting topic to think about. And they are doing trials on that. I feel like maybe I maybe I heard some banter, but correct me if I'm wrong about RSV vaccines. Oh, okay. Maybe. I actually give a plug for the HIV for the internist talk uh, given by Megan Brundred, who actually, I, I won't get into all that. There's a lot of really great practical turls, pearls in terms of just even, even if you're not managing the ART, there's lots of primary care stuff that you can do. But she led with the point that um, youths with HIV just tend to not do as well. So patients, younger patients have lower viral suppression rates. They are diagnosed less frequently. Uh, they receive less care, they are retained in care less. And so just focusing on what you can do in terms of being aggressive, in terms of screening, doing your best to lower barriers to care, or doing your best to actually create an environment that patients feel welcome in and that is non-judgmental so that you can retain them in care are really important things that we can do because 
younger patients who have HIV may not even recognize that they have it. And we just need to to capture those patients and hang on to them and treat them. Um, because the point that cannot be made strongly enough, once you achieve viral suppression, you're untransmissible. U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. We should be counseling all patients about this. It reduces community stigma. It promotes prevention. And so it's, it's another way to kind of move towards eliminating or at least really well controlling what has been devastating in not too recent history. She also, just I'm going to make the primary care point just because I was fascinated by this and I didn't know this personally. In terms of just sort of primary care stuff, she went through a lot of the preventive screening we should be doing and how PAP guidelines vary for patients who are living with HIV and how there's just a bazillion vaccination considerations. But the point I'm going to emphasize is actually the diabetes screening, which I thought was fascinating. It turns out that they recommend checking a hemoglobin A1C before starting ART because once on ART, patients tend to be, uh, A1C is less reliable in terms of making the diagnosis and there's sort of variable effects and some of it's due to, they think, HIV itself and some of it's due to medications and most notoriously their protease inhibitors, but some of the classes can actually affect how the A1C works. So if you're, they're actually considering doing like fasting glucose or even glucose tolerance tests if you have suspicion and being fairly aggressive in that way because the A1C may not be as good a test for making the diagnosis. So it was a nice reminder to me. I may have known that at some point, but if I did, I forgot about it. So I thought that was interesting. Did they mention lipid screening in this patient population Great as question. well? Let me tell you, Dr. Toronto, you should probably <laughs> do a lipid panel upon entry to care and then one to three months after starting ART because again, both HIV and the medications themselves do actually have um, deleterious impact on on lipids. And you still use the pooled cohort equation to calculate the patient's risk. Um, but in the 2018 revision to the guidelines, actually HIV is a known risk enhancer and mm-hmm. should be brought into consideration when considering risk reduction for cardiovascular disease. So thank you for thank you for raising that point. All right, and I will turn back to Alan to tell us a, a little bit about atrial fibrillation. Well, and, and, and Paul, there's a million things to learn about, but your first point about HIV in use I really worry about that because one of the other little themes I've seen in several presentations is the increased rate of STIs over the past several years, which may be pandemic related or not. Syphilis was a big one. There was a, a good thieves market presentation, which is a fun session to go to if people want to want to watch one about where they go through some cases. And it was a weird case of syphilis. And he mentioned that about half people that have syphilis don't have that that primary ulcer that we always sort of think of as, as classic. And case? it was syphilis that had hepatic and pancreatic and GI, actually presented with GI bleeding, mm. um, secondary syphilis. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's useful for us to always, with this increased risk of syphilis, be thinking about, okay, could this be syphilis and all its yeah. weird manifestations? But I think the bigger point is, you know, how do we help our young people really go through a tumultuous time here with the pandemic and yeah. school closures and lots of social structures broken down? All right, the last sort of paradigm shifting area of focus for me was rethinking AFib. So I've been a, a doc now for 22 years, and AFib was always one of those diseases that the evidence, I think, supported being able to manage it in primary care with anticoagulation and, and rate control. And so like, like diabetes, I always tried to, to teach my learners and, and work towards sort of how can we do this independently, not necessarily have to call in the cardiologist or in the case of diabetes, endocrinologist to help us manage this. And one of the rethinking with the evidence of benefit of rhythm control that has come out over the past few years over rate control, which is in contrast to what the evidence said 15, 18 years ago, is that we need to move more quickly into rhythm control because we're trying to prevent these ectopic focuses turning into fibrosis and remodeling and all these sort of things you get down the down the road. And so we are probably going to have to reform, or I will start referring more to cardiology for early evaluation and early intervention in, in atrial fibrillation. And this is, is going to be a challenge for us because one of the things that increases the risk of AFib is obesity. And as we've talked about, obesity is, is certainly going up. Not clear what why obesity is is linked with AFib, but as we're seeing increased uh, rates of that, we're going to have more AFib and then more need to refer to electrophysiology. And so there's a, a capacity issue there that we're going to have to try to figure out. And it may mean those of us that are general internists doing more, you know, amiodarone or even class one C antiarrhythmic management and getting more comfortable with those those kinds of things as we as we go forward. So. It, that's a that's a little bit of a shift for me and moving away from my own independence, which I'm not sure I like, but here we are. It's 2022. We learn new things. Paul, can I uh, can I remind you last what was it last summer? I think we did an episode, kind of an update on AFib, mm-hmm. and we were talking about it was a change. I mean, I think my big take homes and Paul, tell me tell me if you have anything different that you can recall. The shorter time they've had AFib, especially if it's under a year, you know, consider rhythm control. Folks with heart failure, whether it's preserved EF or reduced EF, um, they seem to do better with rhythm control. And then, Paul, if you're going to be in there doing something with the heart, just just sew up the atrial appendage, right, Paul? Sure. I mean, you may as well. Yeah. 
No, that, that, that's exactly right. I think I, we were talking about this before. Like, I feel like this idea of rhythm being better than rate control, I'm sorry, rate being better than rhythm control is one of those things that we're just holding on to like grim death, even though the evidence is no longer supporting that. And I just think we we probably owe our patients exactly as, as Alan's saying, probably um, a bunch of physiology evaluations sooner rather than later, just to make sure that we can keep them happy and healthy. Yeah. And he was advocating trying to get people in within a month, particularly if they've oh, got wow. persistent AFib. The, the tricky ones are the people that you catch a little AFib. So, so periop, yeah. you know, that, that patient can probably, <laughs> if it gets better, they don't, may not need to go to, to EP or the person that, that's sort of in and out and you catch it here and there. Um, maybe you wait a little longer on them, but I mean, honestly, we, we need to, to be pretty aggressive with these folks because that remodeling can happen quickly. Yeah. All right. Shall we wrap things up? Any any final thoughts? Anything else? Any other tips or pearls that we, we absolutely had to say out loud? I don't know, Paul. Did you want to give any kind of poignant reflection on your time at the American <laughs> College of Physicians? I've been home literally isolating with COVID, which is great irony, Paul, after <laughs> after a three-year absence. I was I was very uh, soul-crushed, uh, to, put it, to put it lightly. Yeah, I, I will, Matt. It's been scary without you and lonely. Um, yeah, it's it's I, it's just not been the same. But and yet, it was still spectacular. I, this was just I think a sliver of the stuff that we learned. Like it was it was really hard to pare down all the things that we wanted to include just in the few sessions that we actually got to. Um, so I, it's it's an enormous conference, and obviously I'm, I'm thrilled that they were um, able to have us back this year and see everybody in person. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. I, I wonder who's going to take their time to shine. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and while you're there, we'll stand for a mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, plus twice each month you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. We are committed to providing you with high-value practice-changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback, so please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that many of our episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. A special thanks to the writers and producers for this episode, which is everybody here, but we'll go through. Matt Watto, Chris the Chew Man Chew, sitting silently but managing the sound, Nora Toronto, Molly Hoybline, Alan Dow, Avio Glasser, and myself, Dr. Paul Williams. This episode was produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all of that, let's go around the table and sign off. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I've been Dr. Nora Plout Toronto. And I'm Dr. Molly Hoyblein. Alan Dell, thanks for having me. Avital Yehudit Oglasser. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>